are in a week two of our Disconnected series, and um, last week we uh, saw about Hosea, and uh, that God has called us to love those, even the people that hurt us, and that God has called us to live in redemption. He wants to redeem relationships, and this week we're going to look at the life of Samson, and you might be much more familiar with Samson than you were with Hosea. Samson has even been made into a movie. You've probably seen that. Hosea probably could not be a TV show, all right? That probably wouldn't fly with the ratings. And so uh, you're probably a little bit more familiar with Samson. But I want to give you a little bit about how Samson's life began. In Judges 13, um, we see that the Philistines have conquered the Israelites again. And if you're familiar with the book of Judges, what will happen is this. The Israelites will reject God, and then God will send a judge They'll free them for a little bit, then they'll reject again, and they'll free them for a little bit. It's just this vicious cycle. And it's been 40 years that the Philistines have dominated um, the Israelites. And so God tells Samson's mother, and she wasn't able to have a kid, so an angel comes and tells her that you're going to have a baby. And that baby is going to be my person to lead the Israelites. But here's the thing. With this, there wasn't just any baby. He was going to have a special command on his life. He was going to have a Nazarite vow. Let me explain what that means. A Nazarite vow is this. It means that you've made a vow not to cut your hair, that you do not drink any fermented drinks, you don't drink any alcohol, and you don't touch any dead animals. That is on top of all the Jewish laws that are already there. So that is what Samson is supposed to grow up and to follow these laws. And then he is going to lead the Israelites. You see... Samson was set apart from birth for God. God had a special purpose for him. And we see at the end of this chapter that it says that the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in Samson. And he began to feel God's call. But Samson was God's person to live out God's intended purpose. He was God's person to live out God's purpose. Hey, it's better than a smoke alarm. We had that once. So uh, now that may sound a little bit um, familiar, this idea that God, he was called. Because while I doubt that an angel came to your parents before you were born and said, you're going to have a child, and they're going to have a specific purpose. Now if that did happen, I do really want to hear that story, all right? I doubt that's what happened. But if you have chosen to be a Christian, you have chosen to be set apart for God's specific purpose. You have chosen to be sanctified, which is what God does. He sets us apart as holy, and Samson was set apart for God's specific purpose. And we are made holy by Jesus, and we're set apart from the world as God's hands in the world. We are God's people in our community and in the world. And you may be wondering, where is this going? I mean, we're supposed to be talking about relationships, but let me explain. I think what we see with Samson is critical to us having healthy relationships. It all starts with this. It all starts with the calling that we have in our life and if we will listen to it or not. Way too often, people decide to be a Christian and to follow Jesus, but we only follow the parts that are convenient. I love the salvation part, and I love that forgiveness part, but the rest of it, I don't know that I'm going to do. That's not as convenient, and that's not as fun, but I do love these parts of Christianity. And when we do that, we will see that we have dysfunction in our life. And we're going to see how Samson, even though he was called for God's purpose, chose to only pick part of what God had told him to do. But for us to have healthy relationships, we have to live out God's call in our life, and we follow his plan in every part. And when we do, then we won't have relationships that are breaking down as often. And they won't break down with such great intensity when we are following God's plan for our own life. Because in reality, we're a lot like Samson. And the first way we see that we're like Samson is this. God has put a calling on your life. God has put a calling on your life. Now, here's the thing. There's two types of calls. There's a general call, and then there's a specific call. Here's what a general call is. If you are a Christian, you are called by God to love your neighbor. You are called to live by the the fruit of the Spirit. You are called to forgive. You are called to evangelize and share Jesus. If you are a Christian, we all share that call. That is for every single one of us that we do as Christians. But God also has a specific call for your life. God has a call that it is for you and you alone to answer. Uh, Maybe 
It, God has given you a skill, and maybe it's to teach kids about God. Uh, maybe it is to be part of the worship team because God has given you that gift, and that is what your specific call is in your life. But based on who you are, your experiences, your shape is what we call it, God has a specific call on your life. There are two types of calls that we see, and Samson had a specific call in his life. He was to lead the Israelites, and he led for 20 years, but here's the thing. They were still under Philistine occupation. He chose not to live up to his call. God called Samson to free his people, but Samson had other ideas. He had other ideas on what he was going to do. He went against what God said to do many times. The issue is sometimes that when we are Christians, we confuse God's call with our desire and wants in life. For instance, I could say, God is calling me to buy a bass boat. It is distinct and clear. It is God's word that I need to do that. Now, the chances are good that I've mistaken God's call for my own personal wants and desire, but that's where the problem begins to start. See, there are many messages that we get daily that would lead us to believe something different than what God wants for us. Uh, we have to start by knowing God's guidance in our life. We have to know God's voice. There was an explorer deep in the Amazon jungle, and he found himself surrounded by a group of what he thought were cannibals. The explorer said quickly, quietly to himself, he said, I'm doomed. But then suddenly, a ray of light shined from the sky, and a voice boomed out. No, my son, you are not doomed. Pick up that stone at your feet and bash in the head of the chief standing in front of you. The explorer picked up the stone and he attacked the chief. And after a few swift blows, he looked down at the chief's lifeless body. And the rest of the cannibals just stared silently at the explorer. And then the voice boomed out again. Okay, now you're doomed. <laughs> you see, we can listen to things all around us, but we need to be sure it is God that is telling us what to do. Because if not, we'll be doomed. And our relationships will fail as well. Yet too many of us have listened to other sources that sound good at the time. When we see it on TV, on commercials, what is it that's going to make you happy? What is it you want? We believe that the idea that the world revolves around us, that life is all about making ourselves happy. Just do what you want as long as you're happy. I mean, really, I mean, isn't that what God would want? I mean, isn't it really that God's number one priority is that you're happy? But here's the problem with that. There's an issue with that thinking. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? God warned us against this type of thinking. The heart leads us astray. God never said he expects us to be happy. God has only said he wants us to be holy. God has never said he wants us to be happy. He's just said he wants us to be holy. And God's word is truth. And when we listen to the wrong voices, we will have trouble. And we'll compound that trouble in any relationships we have. Now, there's a major key that a lot of people forget about when they think about having healthy relationships, and that's what our series is about, is looking at dysfunctional relationships in the Bible, and how do we take principles from that so that we can have healthy relationships? And one of the things that we forget about is this. It all starts with us. It all starts with us. We have to be right with God personally to have healthy relationships. I mean, we see this this issue in Samson's life. He starts off on the wrong foot. He becomes an adult, and the first thing he does is to go marry a Philistine woman. Wait a second. That's the enemy. That is who God doesn't want around you, but he says, I don't care. I'm going to go marry her. Now, the text shows us that God used Samson's rebellion, but he was still rebelling against God's plans. The Philistines were the enemy, and he shouldn't have been trying to marry one as God's leaders of the Israelites. He basically lived how he wanted. Let me show you. There's a great story about Samson. He's walking down this path and a lion jumps out. And I love this story because I have this mental image. You know, this lion jumps out and it says he rips it in half. Like, I don't even know what that means. It just sounds cool. Like, did he grab the jaw and just, you know, yank its head apart? I don't know what it did. But anyway, he's walking down this path. He kills this lion and he leaves it on the side of the road. He's walking down this path again and he looks down one day now remember, he took a Nazarite vow. Don't touch dead things, don't cut your hair, don't drink alcohol. I mean, he sees this dead animal. And then he sees a bunch of bees on it. And then he sees some honey. And he reaches down and he scoops some honey out of this dead animal. 
which is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> a million health code violations. And he scoops this honey out and he begins to eat it. Wait a second, Samson, you're a Nazarite. Well, I don't care. You know, that, that's, that's Samson's attitude about everything. I'm going to go marry a Philistine. I'll touch dead things. I don't care what God's call is in my life. Samson had a dysfunctional relationship with God, and we're going to see what happened because of that. You see, he was not right with God's plan. He didn't follow God's path for him. God set him apart, but he chose to do whatever he wanted over and over again. He didn't live up to his vow to God, and his relationships with God broke down. Samson, like many of us, he just kind of chased his own desires. He chased what made him feel good, what he wanted to do, and not God's call on his life. He lusted after this woman he shouldn't have married. He did what he wanted. He ate what he wanted. He lived like a pagan, and God was clearly not important to him. He was unhealthy, and he was so unhealthy that any relationships that he had, guess what? They were going to be unhealthy too. They were going to be unhealthy too. He had rejected God in most practical ways, and And you see, we have to start working on us, then we can have healthy relationships. But there's so many ways we get off track from God's call, and here are a few. And I use these because I've noticed these in society in general, or I've dealt with people that have come to me. And one of the ways that we get off focus off God's call is through our narcissism or our self-centeredness. Let me explain narcissism. It means excessive interest or admiration for ourselves. Now, this doesn't have to be clinical. But we see it all over the place. I mean, our culture is all about showing ourselves and life off. Uh, that's what it's, it's all about. Everything in life is about me. Look at me. Look what I've done. We see that over and over again. And 2 Timothy 3 says this. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. In Samson's life, we see over and over again, he has a form of godliness, but he's denying God's power in his life. You can see the relational issues here. If you are boastful, if you are proud, without love, if you're all about yourself, you're not going to have good relationships. You're just not. You can see that the problems that that need to be fixed. And instead, Jesus gives us this answer. Matthew 20. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. You see the difference? That difference about how we are growing, how we are not dysfunctional with God, is how relationships are good, how they're healthy. Here are some practical questions you might ask somebody if you are putting them first. You might ask yourself this. How often do you think about what they would like? Do you think that the other person would like something? Do you think about them? Would this make them happy or make them smile? It's not your job to bring them happiness, but when you love somebody, when you care about somebody, you think about what they would like. You know, you think, I could do this for them. Maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's a big thing. To get out of that self-centeredness, we think of them. Those are the questions we ask ourselves about others when we are living according to Matthew 20. So what other ways do we live in unhealth? When we choose to be a martyr. Let me explain this. That doesn't mean that we have suffered real persecution. We just act like it. And you know people that are are like that. You know, they think they've been persecuted. I mean, here's the definition. It's to act like someone who deserves admiration or sympathy because of being badly treated. To act like someone. You know those people. Oh, I'll do it because no one else will. I always bring out my Eeyore voice whenever I do that too. Oh, you know what? No one else will do it. Poor me. Don't worry about me. I'm just over here doing everybody else's job. How many people do you know that are like that? Everything, they're just playing the martyr. And we keep living worn out because we feel needed or wanted that way when we live as the martyr. We get sympathy. We get a pat on the back from others. But again, we're missing God's call. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. When we live as martyrs, our unhealth will create issues in all of our relationships. Now, I've listed these in and, and this last one because of the ones I run into the most. And here's the last one. Everyone wronged you. When you are living in dysfunction and everyone 
wrongs you, you're always looking for offense. Everything someone says has some hidden meaning. They said this, oh, but I know they meant this. Oh, that's what they said. Well, did they say that? No, but that's what they meant. That's what they meant. You, you know, I mean, everything someone does is against us. If we aren't invited to something, they hate us. This goes along with the narcissism issue. But our society has helped us get there. Everything is public now. Everything that everybody does is public. I mean, whatever anybody eats, they show it, okay? I'm going to start posting what I just chewed up, all right? I mean, it's just, like, it just everything is public. It doesn't matter. It's just all out there and so we're upset about things we didn't even know that happened but we weren't invited to oh i can't believe they didn't invite me we want to look for offense and if you are looking to be offended you will be if you're looking for that you will be but if you are offended easily then i'm willing to bet it's hard for you to have good relationships you're always looking for the other shoe to drop You're always looking for them to say something that is mean to you or against you. If you're looking to be offended, you're going to be offended. You see, something always comes up. I bet, again, someone always does something to you. Do you see the issue? Do you see the issue? People are, I've talked to people in my office, and they're struggling in their relationships. And they say this. They said, why can't I have a healthy relationship? And because my gift is mercy, I said, because you're in it. That's why you can't have a healthy relationship, because you're dysfunctional. You see, for us to have healthy relationships, we have to be, have a proper relationship with God. We cannot be dysfunctional so that we can have healthy relationships. You see, we have to quit being self-centered, quit playing the martyr, quit being so offended by everything. We are the common denominator of unhealthy relationships. So many relationship after relationship keeps breaking down, there's only one place to go back to. That's us. If my relationships are never good and and I don't have anybody that likes me and I do all these things, guess what? There's only one place to go back to and that's me and I know it's hard. That hurts. But see, when we get a functional, good relationship with God, we can fix all that and we do that by living out God's call, both generally and specifically. And when we do that, live out God's call for our life, our relationships will improve. So once we've done that, we, what we can control, we put God first in our life. The next step is this. God has to be the center of any strong relationship. Our closest relationships need to be God-centered. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have any non-Christian friends. We have to witness. We have to be in the world. But think about this for a second. If someone has what we would believe to be a faulty worldview, then their advice into our life is coming from a faulty perspective. Does that make sense? If we believe that their worldview is wrong and they say, I don't believe in God, Um, God can't take care of you, I don't believe that any of that stuff, then whatever they tell us is going to probably come from a faulty worldview. Now that doesn't mean that all your non-Christian friends are wrong when they tell you something, but they aren't coming from the same perspective we are. I mean, look at all this dysfunction that is going on with Samson. He chose a Philistine. They hated the God of the Israelites. He broke his vows to God over and over again. He allowed his dysfunction to put him in a terrible spot. His lust overcame his thinking. God was not the center of Samson's life, and we see all these relational problems, and we finally get to the last one. We see a major, major dysfunctional relationship with him and Delilah. I mean, you want to talk about dysfunction. Samson brought it with him into every relationship. Let me tell you what happened. Judges 16 says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the rulers of the Philistines went to her, she's a Philistine, and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. Okay, so basically, they said, hey, we know you and Samson are together, but we're going to assume that relationship is not near as tight as what Samson seems to think it is. And we're going to pay you to let us know how he is strong, and they even told her what they were going to do so that we can tie him up and subdue him. Now, 1,100 shekels of silver, in case you're wondering, is about $5,000 today based on the weight and the price of, uh, of silver. Back then, it would have been a lot, a lot of money. And I don't know how many rulers of the Philistines there were. Maybe it's three, four, five, I don't know. But each one was going to give her $5,000 to uh, do this. Sounded good to her because the relationship was not near as close as what Samson seemed to think. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your strength and how you can be tied up and subdued, which is just a weird question to start with. 
All right, that's just weird. And he says, okay, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings and never been dried, I'll become weak. So he wakes up, and that's what's happened to him. And the Philistines come in, he breaks those, and he defeats them. All right, something's wrong here. All right, all right something's weird and going on. So then Delilah said to Samson, you made a fool of me, you lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties new ropes on me that have never been used, I'll become weak. And yet, so he goes to sleep, he wakes up, and guess what? There's new ropes tied on him, and the Philistines come in, he snaps them, and he uh, defeats the Philistines. Again, he, what he said was done to him. I'm going to be honest. It is beginning to look like that what God gave Samson in strength, he took away from the brain department. <laughs> God's like, you cannot be smart and strong. You can choose one. And you are really, really strong, so guess where you're going to be really, really lacking? But again, Samson was not living by God's call. He is living in a relationship that he shouldn't have with a Philistine woman. And he, over and over again, his dysfunctional life has put him in this situation. He wouldn't even be in this situation or this relationship if he had not chosen to live a life of dysfunction. It is dysfunctional because he was choosing to have a dysfunctional relationship with God. So Delilah said to Samson, all the time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me, tell me how you can be tied. Which again, what is his problem? He says, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten with the pin, I'll become weak. So he goes to sleep. I guess he's a sound sleeper because she takes his hair and weaves it into a loom. He has seven braids. So big braids, because remember, he can't cut his hair, so it's really long. It's about the only Nazarite valley he actually kept. And so it's really long. And she weaves it into a loom, and he wakes up. I always picture this in my head, that when he wakes up, he just kind of, you know, takes his head, and he whips it around, and he brushes the loom, the loom against the, uh, the wall there, and it all shatters. And the Philistines come in, and he defeats all of them. And again, for the third time, he wakes up, and it was done to him. I guess he doesn't see the pattern, but this is crazy dysfunctional. This is what it would be like. Imagine you're sharing with your spouse. And you're just opening up and you tell them, you know what? I have this phobia. I'm scared to death of mice. All right, you know, you share. The next morning you wake up, there's a dead mouse on your pillow next to your head. That's psychopath. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. Everything he says, I don't want to do, I don't want this to happen to me, that's what happens the next day. This is crazy, crazy dysfunctional. Hopefully I didn't give you guys any ideas, all right? Don't, don't use the phobias of your spouse against them. But he has this de- just general dysfunction that he lives in with God. All these problems that he has with God are now going out to all his relationships. And then she said to him, how can you say I love you? Uh-oh, she brought out the big guns. When you won't even confide in me. And then it says, With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until she was sick to death of it. She brought out the you don't love me card. You don't love me because you didn't whatever it was. She is playing on his desire for her. And here's the thing. Dysfunction uses a lot of coercion techniques. Oh, if you cared, you would do this. But that's not what God wants. It doesn't matter what God wants. If you loved me, oh, you would do this if... You see, dysfunction brings that coercion into relationships. But if we are healthy with God, we know our boundaries, we know what we will and won't do, and we have the discussion say, nope, this is what God wants me to do. And so we see this coercion in this dysfunctional dance, and then finally Samson gives in. The nagging got to him, it says he was sick to death of the nagging, and he says this, no one's ever shaved my head. My head's never been shaved, and if it does, I'll become weak. And so, guess what? Hard to believe. He goes to sleep, and the next morning he's bald, all right? And uh, he just shaved it all off, cut off the, his hair. The Philistines come, and they seize him, and verse 21 says this. They seized him, they gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Let me tell you what that means. So they capture him, they poke his eyes out so Samson can't see, because Samson's been killing these Philistines. He killed a thousand of them with a jawbone of a donkey. I mean, they can't do anything to him. They finally get him weak, and what, there's a giant stone, is what this means by grinding grain, and they would have slaves chained to one of the wood poles, and they would just walk in a circle all day long. And that would grind the grain under the, wheat, the wheel and under the weight of that wheel. And that's what Samson's doing, day after day. And his hair is beginning to grow back a little bit. You see, he finally gave in 
And this dysfunctional relationship overcame him. He could have left any time. He could have been strong and not told her anything because he could have said, no, I'm right with God and God wants me to do this, but he didn't. You see, when he drifted from God, which was his base of truth and guidelines, then anything can happen, and that's the same for us. When we drift from our basis of God and his guidelines for our lives, and we don't follow what God wants, bad things are going to happen in our relationships, and it's all going to be because we have left what God has told us to do. And I know what you're thinking to yourself. Come on, man. Samson, how could you be so dumb? Four times she's asking you what it is, and every time you wake up. But it wasn't about that. You see, it wasn't about Delilah, and it wasn't about that relationship. It was about Samson and God. God was nowhere near this relationship, and awful things happened. He knew better, but he had chosen to live apart from God, God's plan, for so long that he couldn't even recognize dysfunction. I bet everybody here knows somebody that has, have had major issues in their personal life based on not following God's plan. You probably know that. And then, sometimes it seems like they have relationships with other people who are really messed up also. And dysfunction kind of attracts each other. When I was in college, they gave us all the Myers-Briggs test when we go to college. And I'm not sure why they give, gave that to us. But it was really interesting because it was almost like they did that to see if they could find the two craziest people and stick them in a room together. It was like a social experiment. And so I'm like, that's weird. Like, how are you two roommates? You guys are nuts. And you notice that in life. People who have personal dysfunction find other people in dysfunction to have relationship with. And the dysfunction multiplies. And then they blame God. Oh, I cannot believe God let this fall apart. Here's my answer. I can't believe that God has allowed this flaming basket of insanity to exist this long. That's what I can't believe. And when we're not right with God, everything else is dysfunctional. Everything else is messed up. You see, God can only create healthy relationships when we decide to follow his principles, both personally and in our relationships. That's where it all starts. It starts with me. If my relationships are falling apart, I'm the common denominator. And if, and if I can't have a strong connection with people, I, I'm the common denominator. Now, I'm not saying any of us are perfect. But we can, make, we can definitely make choices that move our life forward in a godly way. Healthy relationships happen with healthy people. Healthy relationships happen with healthy people. And it's our job to make sure that we are right with God, and that's what will make us healthy. So we don't let our selfish desires keep God out of our relationships. And finally, as we conclude this story of Samson, we see this. We can prevent the need to ask God to remember us. Judges 16, 28. Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistine for my two eyes. So Samson's in this position. He's grinding the grain. His hair's grown back. He doesn't say, man, God, I, I probably should have stayed with you. Uh, those relationships are some bad ideas. He just is worried about revenge. <laughs> not, not a godly plan, but you know why he wants revenge? Because he is so disconnected from God. All he has is hate. Oh, he doesn't even understand what God would want for his life. So let me explain what this means for us. It is like asking someone this idea. Do you say, somebody, do you have any regrets? And they might answer to you, well, you know, I, if I was going to have a regret, then I wouldn't have done it in the first place. If I was going to have a regret, I wouldn't have done it in the first place. And here's the thing. We don't have to be distant from God. We have to be proactive to prevent the problems. And if Samson had done what God wanted, if he had kept his vows, he would not have been with Delilah. He would not have ended up here. But he chose to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. We don't have to be distant from God and beg for him to come back to us if we don't leave in the first place. I can't tell you how many people I know that said, I'm a God follower, I love God. But just some of the parts. And then they get in a relationship or whatever it is and God goes by the wayside and the relationship has got dysfunction over dysfunction over dysfunction. And they go, I can't believe that happened. 
It happened because we are not healthy and right with God. That's where it all starts. By keeping God at the center of our relationship, the fallout won't be as disastrous. I mean, look at where Samson is. It is awful. God had a call for him to do so much, but his rejection of God's laws caused him to fall. He was blessed to be super strong and to lead his people. God gave him all that, but it didn't work because he rejected God. He rejected God's personal plan, and that led to failing relationships. I don't want anyone here to be at the end of their life, at the end of a relationship, begging for God to save you, to save it. Instead, bring God in at the beginning, and you probably won't end up in such a terrible place like Samson. When God is at the core, all our relationships work better. I mean, think of any relationship area, and you can see how having God at the center of our life and our relationship will make things so much better. I mean, think about marriage. How is God at the center? Do we love each other? Treat each other with respect? Give yourself up for one another. We're going to do a marriage and family series after Easter called Building Blocks, and I'm really excited uh, um, about it. But we know that God at the center has a positive effect. I want to tell you this statistic I found. It's really it's really cool. It's not what most people believe. It's against common belief and based on the best data available. The divorce rate among Christians is significantly lower than the general population. That may not be what you heard. Maybe you've heard it's the same, but let me explain. Here's the truth. Many people who seriously practice a traditional religious faith, be it Christian or other, have a divorce rate markedly lower than the general population. The factor making the most difference is religious commitment and practice. So what you thought was true, it, it does work. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, attend church nearly every week, read their Bibles and spiritual materials regularly, pray privately and together, generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but serious disciples, they enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members, than the general population and general unbelievers. You see the key here? Who is at the center? Let me go on and tell you this, it's interesting. Bradley Wright, a sociologist at the University of Connecticut, explains from his analysis of people who identify as Christians but rarely attend church that 60% of these have been divorced. Of those who attend church regularly, 38% have been divorced. Let me explain what that means. Now, he's just using divorce because it's an easy statistic to see, but here is the thing. What he's saying is this. Is God at the center and are you serious about following God? And if you are serious about following God, your relationships are better. It's very basic. And if you've got a foot in both worlds and you go, yeah, I'm a Christian, I like that salvation part, that forgiveness, but I'm going to live over here and do this at the same time, your relationships are not as good. It's very basic. Very basic. Other data from additional sociologists of family and religion suggest a significant marital stability divide between those who take their faith seriously and those who do not. Bradford Wilcox, a leading sociologist at the University of Virginia and the director of the National Marriage Project, finds from his own analysis that active conservative Protestants, notice the word active, who regularly attend church are 35% less likely to divorce compared to those who have no affiliation. Nominally attending conservative Protestants are 20% more likely to divorce compared to secular Americans. <laughs> I love that stat. If you think you're a Christian, but you don't live like it, you really have got problems. That's basically what they just said. But if you're a Christian and God is at the center and God is at the core, your relationships can be strong and healthy and in the average way better than other people. So is God at the center of the relationship? And how is God at the center? They told us. Go to church together, read God's word, pray together and individually. These habits grow our faith, our walk with God, and clearly our relationships. You see, God has to be the part of any strong relationship. And we're going to look more at that in a month, but no surprise, guess what? God's presence in our life makes a difference. It really does. Friendships. What about godly friends? They want, you, they want what God wants for you. They don't lead you into trouble. I mean, think about it. You know there's that kid in school that you hung out with. Your parents were like, don't hang out with that kid because he's going to get you in trouble. And if something came up, they were like, let's go do it. Nobody will know. That may have been you, actually, some of you guys. May have been that kid. That's why you're here. You're repenting for what you did when you were a kid. And you got everybody else in, in trouble. But real friends don't lead us into trouble. I mean, the answer isn't easy, but they push you to God's leading in your life. It's not what do I want you to do as a friend. It's what does God want you to do. Are you fulfilling God's specific call? You see, God at the center of friendship makes lifelong friends a strong group that is powerful for God. 
family relationships? Do we love like God loves us? We forgive and we move each other towards holiness. God at the center creates unity and direction. You see, God-centered family creates priorities for a family unit. All decisions are based over what God would want for us. And again, we're going to look at that in about a month. What about work relationships? Do we work hard as unto the Lord? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you want them to do to you. Because when we do these things, there'll be much fewer work relationship problems for the most part. A lot of people at work want to do this. But they did less. They didn't do their job, or they didn't do this, or, or them. It's all about that. No, it's all about us. And we create dysfunction by not doing what God has called us to do. You see, God has commanded us to work hard, to be fair, to be honest, and these traits are universally applauded everywhere. And again, God at my core changes all my relationships. If I don't want dysfunction in my relationships, I can't have dysfunction with God in my own life. That's what God has called us to do. And we can see that the only way for these relationships to be strong is when God is at the center of our whole life and everything that we do, and then he can be at the center of our relationships. And when we are like that, we won't end up being like Samson. But the first part is key. God has to be the center of our lives. And that means that we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior and that our life is based on what he wants for us. And we call that here at Southern Heights, we call that getting on base with God. The B is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. A is to admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. S is to surrender my life and say, God, you are in charge and you are the core of my life and my relationships and personally. And E is to express that in Christian baptism. And by accepting God's grace and forgiveness, you will change and your relationships will change. Your relationships will go from dysfunctional to great when God is at the core of who we are. And then we can truly have the abundant life. But if you already made that decision to have the abundant life through Jesus, then here's our homework this week. Last week, our homework was to redeem a relationship in our life that needed redeemed. And this week it's this. To see what we need to change so that we can be healthy followers of God. It's no more point in, oh, they did this, or if my spouse would just do that, or if this person would just do that, my family member just did this. It's not about that. What do I need to change? What can I do to fix myself so that I am right with God, so that all my relationships are healthy? Do I need to change my thinking? What about my attitude will allow me to, to follow God's calling on my life? Maybe it's not just being so self-centered and instead it's putting others first. Maybe it's not looking for offense at every turn. Whatever it is, what is keeping us from being healthy so that we can have healthy relationships? As we've seen with Samson, if we reject God's leading in our life, then our relationships will reflect the lack of God in them. You see, healthy relationships start with healthy Christ followers. And I hope none of us are like Samson and have these dysfunctional relationships. And we can avoid that when we put God at the center of our life first and we worry about us changing to look.
relationship here with 